Hello, my precious friends. Welcome again into the Word of God. I want to welcome you to a brand new week. We're in lesson six, lesson six of our great controversy theme. My name is Dwayne Esmond, and I am privileged to be your tour guide for this week, just for a few moments here and there, inviting you into what will be, I believe, a wonderful study. Do you remember last week, Faith Against All Odds? What an awesome study that was as we learned about our our, our reformers, our early uh, uh, Christian martyrs and reformers who were dedicated to the word of God and exercised faith against all odds. Well, this week, we're looking at the two witnesses, the two witnesses. Do you know what those are? You just might. The book, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, that the grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever, forever. Throughout history, men and women have tried to discount, discard, and destroy the word of God. But like the phoenix, the proverbial phoenix from the ashes, it rises again to stand and give men light and to condemn falsehood and error and wrong. William Tyndale, Sabbath lesson, prepared to be uh, uh, killed. And he was asked, you know, uh, who has helped you in this work? Who has helped you do what you have done? And he said, the Bishop of Durham. And the Bishop of Durham at the time, the area where Tyndale lived, had purchased a huge sum of Bibles with a huge sum of money and burned them in the public square. Not only did he end up spreading the gospel, but the monies he paid for those Bibles bought even more Bibles than he had burned. And Tyndale spread them far and wide. You cannot kill the word of God, no matter how hard you try. Well, in Sunday's lesson, we learned that there are two witnesses in Scripture, Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, tells us of, of a of a golden lampstand that is buttressed by two two uh, olive trees. These trees give oil symbolically. Oil flows out of these trees. Olive oil flows out of these trees and keeps that lamp burning bright. Revelation chapter eleven and verse three. Jesus says the Bible says that there are two witnesses that God has. Verse three says, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth and ashes. We knew we've studied this this quarter already that that twelve hundred and sixty day period is a twelve hundred and sixty year period in which God's church, the early Christian church, go, flees into the wilderness and and is for a period of time under great to rest, but that God sustains that church and protects that church, and the light of God's word comes out through that church. What are these two witnesses? These two witnesses are the Old and New Testament. The Bible suggests, if one reads closely, that these two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, are the two witnesses that God gives to men and women that teaches them the truth, but also condemns error and falsehood. And sin. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 5 and verse 14, that these two witnesses... That these two witnesses cannot be converted. God says, I'm going to put my word in your mouth, Jeremiah. It will be like fire and the people like wood. It was this word that 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 uh, Elijah used to call down fire from heaven and to stop rain and start rain again. It is this word that Moses spoke and brought the plagues down on Egypt. This word shall stand forever. That's the study this week. These two witnesses stand forever. Hello, my beloved family of God. Welcome to Monday's lesson, Prophetic Time Periods. Prophetic Time Periods. I'm so glad we have the gift of prophetic explanation and prophecy in Scripture that can be trusted, that reminds us that God word, God's Word is trustworthy, and we can, hang, we can hang our hat on the Word of God. Here we go. The Bible says in the Revelation chapter 11, verses uh, 2 and 3, But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot, underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses. That's our study this week. My two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth and ashes. God is saying the Gentiles are going to oppress my holy people for a period of time, 42 months, 1260 days. That ought to, that ought to ring a bell with us. We've been studying this period throughout our time this quarter. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, it's found there. The Bible says there a time that, 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 that there would be a, a persecution, that there would be a persecution for a time, times, and half a time. 
Add that all up prophetically, biblically, and it's 1260 years. We see that same period of time in that, in, in Revelation chapter 12, verses five and six, when that woman, that woman, the church is birth, births a male child and then flees into the wilderness and is persecuted for 1260 days or 1260 years. There's a day year principle in scripture. And that's how you reckon that time. What is God saying? All of these prophecies, Daniel 11 and Daniel 12. I mean, uh, Revelation 11, rather, and Revelation 12 and Daniel 7 all refer to the same period of time. That period of time is that medieval period of time, 5 AD 538 to AD 1798. That period of time when God's people are persecuted. God is saying that my people, my two witnesses, the word of God will be under oppression for a certain period of time. Even as the people who hold to that truth are persecuted, the two witnesses are persecuted with them. That day will be in sackcloth. Now, sackcloth in biblical times means mourning, a time of sorrow, a time of suffering. That's what sackcloth represents. And God is saying, this is my two witnesses will be under duress for a long period of time, 1260 years. And those prophetic time periods can be trusted. They remind us that even though Daniel is writing in his prophecy, Daniel 7 and verse 25, 500 years before the uh, the time of Jesus, 2300 years uh, into that period of time that we know as, as the as the medieval period of time when 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 the the, the church is oppressed and 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 the papal uh, power seems to be as at, at its zenith that during that period of time God's witnesses are still prophesying under duress in sackcloth but still prophesying prophetic time periods tell us that these two witnesses are real my friends the two witnesses are killed. That's our study for today's lesson. The two witnesses die. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The two witnesses are killed. Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. Would you come in your Bibles with me? We're studying today. My name is Dwayne. Come on with me. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. When they finish their testimony. That's that 1260 year period. Those two witnesses have been continually given their testimony. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, that's the enemy, that's Satan, will make war against them. That's those witnesses and those who believe in those witnesses, overcome them and kill them. Kill the witnesses now. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The Bible is speaking figuratively, symbolically here. It is not speaking of the literal Sodom and the literal Egypt, but the spirit of those two cities, the immorality of Sodom and the, the gods of Egypt that take down, that have no allegiance to the one and only true God. God is saying that these two markers will be seen as killing, as killing the actual two witnesses of scripture. Well, how does that come to be? We, re we realized yesterday and learned yesterday that from AD 538 to AD 12, uh, to, to 1260 year period to AD 1798, that 1260 year period of oppression is the period of time when papal oppression is at its zenith, but the two witnesses are still alive. But then uh, a general birth year, uh, Pope, uh, uh, Napoleon's general takes Pope Pius the sixth captive. And when he takes him captive, he dies in prison. And that touches off the French Revolution. During the French Revolution, the Bible is outlawed. Those who believe in scripture are, are being killed. Uh, oppression of, of believers is once again at its height. This time, reason is exalted above all things. In fact, there is a goddess of reason. A, a, a woman is, is, is crowned the goddess of reason and reason is exalted above all things of faith. And so you, you, here you see that, that spirit of, 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 of no God, that no God, uh, certainly not the true God. And then immorality, the other thing talked about uh, as a marker of Sodom, also becomes a marker of the French Revolution. These two things put to death the two witnesses. It's, reminded, it's a reminder to us, beloved, that we really must cherish and prize God in our hearts and in our minds. And we must put away anything that is unlike God. For that is the spirit and the source of the power that actually kills the two witnesses in 
right after the 1260 year period in the French Revolution. The, 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 the Bible, the two witnesses die for a period of, of three and a half years. And we'll see tomorrow they don't stay dead because the word of God never stays dead. Hello, my beloved, precious friends of God. We are in Wednesday's lesson and the two witnesses are back to life. The two witnesses are resurrected. Now, we learned yesterday that atheism, atheism, and, and, and immorality are the hallmarks of the French Revolution. And those hallmarks put to death. Put to death. They want nothing to do with God. They put to death the two witnesses. And those corpses lie in sackcloth, as Revelation 11 tells us, uh, for three and a half days or three and a half years. And they make merry looking at the death of the two witnesses in the street. But then the Bible says this in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 11. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. The two witnesses are coming back to life. And they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Beloved, the two witnesses come back to life and they come back to life with power. Because see, even though the French Revolution had outlawed the study of God's word, the word of God was still in the hearts of his people. Even though during that 1260 year period of the Middle Ages, the medieval period, the Dark Ages, uh, even though there was rampant papal oppression and many of our martyrs and reformers died, the word of God was still in them. The word of God was still being, being taken forward, was still being propagated by those who believed in the God that those who died served, and the word to which they held fealty. Well, here we see, beloved, that that word resurrects itself again, and it comes with great power. Uh, during this period of time, a man by the name of William Carey, uh, William Carey goes as a missionary over to India and spreads the gospel in multiple dialects by translating the Bible into several different dial Indian dialects, and the word of God goes forward again. Voltaire, that great writer said at the time, you know, I'm, I'm, when I get done, it might have taken 12 disciples to, to erect this Christian faith. But when I get done, it will be no more. I, by myself, one man will destroy it. Voltaire is long gone, writes Ellen White, and thousands and thousands now. In the book, Great Controversy, writes thousands, hundreds of thousands now trace their connection to God because of that very word and because of the faith of those who would not yield the truth. What is our study for today telling us? It's telling us, friends, that we can trust the word of God, that even though it's persecuted and discarded and men try to destroy it, the witnesses come back to life because God breathes life back into them. And if he breathed life back into them in those dire circumstances, surely there is still life in the word of God for us even today. As you study, I pray that you will be encouraged and blessed and, in, and that you will know that you can trust the word of God, that there's life in that word, and it cannot ever fail. Tomorrow, we'll see that that word is always triumphant. May God bless you. Well, friends, we are in Thursday's lesson today, and today the title is Truth Triumphant. Truth Triumphant. Come with me again to Revelation 11. We've been here the last few days, and it gets sweeter. You can't not miss Revelation 11, 15 to 18. May I read it in the word of God? Revelation 11 now, 15 to 18. Follow with me. Then the seventh angel sounded and there was loud and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen to that. And the, and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped him, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The Bible predicts triumph. The Bible predicts that God is going to triumph over every effort of the enemy to destroy the word of God. Every effort to destroy the two witnesses will fail. And the word of God will stand forever as Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 tells us. The grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of the Lord, the word of God will stand forever. Jesus says, the Bible says here, that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. How serious is that word? How serious is the law and the testimony of God? How serious is God about his word? Well, let's go to verse 19, verse 19 of Revelation chapter 11. The Bible says this, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and noises and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. 
grace of God is a powerful thing. It's a wonderful thing. But notice in the temple, when John is taken in vision, he sees the ark of God. He sees the covenant of God that God has made with his people. He sees the law of God hidden in that ark and in that temple. Why is that critical? Because it tells us of the sacredness of God's word, of the sacredness of his commands, the sacredness of his covenant and his promises. God takes it so seriously that the earthly sanctuary, the earthly ark, which was a type of the heavenly sanctuary, that that ark of the covenant contains the very law of God here. It also contains it up there for the law is a transcript of God's character of love. God doesn't change things just because you know, heaven is, is, is high, high, high and far away from earth. The, the, the same things he wanted us to be aware of and to, and, and, and to, be, to be faithful to and, and, and to keep in our hearts down here, the same things are prized in heaven. God is saying to us, my word, my witnesses, my, my word, my covenants, my commands, those things that David prized and writes about so powerfully in Psalm 119, they will not fade. They are for us and we should keep them forever. Well, beloved family of God, we are, we have come to the end of another week and what a week it has been. Have you been blessed by the two witnesses? Aren't you glad we have these two witnesses? We have the Bible, man. We have the Old and the New Testament. Some people want to throw away the Old Testament. Don't throw it away. Uh, it, we, we, it is one continuous stream of information from God. It is God's communication to us, Old and New Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were carried along and moved by the Holy Spirit. All of this scripture is good for us. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 is our memory text this week. Listen, the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of God will stand forever. We learned that these two witnesses in Jack, Zechariah chapter 4 are the Old and New Testament. These two, these two uh, uh, trees, these two olive trees that, that whose uh, uh, oil comes out into the golden lampstand and lights up the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. That those two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, are the Old and New Testament. We learned in Revelation chapter 11, 1 to 19, that during the French Revolution, there was an attempt by the enemy to destroy these witnesses. We learned that the witnesses died. Isn't that right? During that three and a half day, three and a half year period of time, when, when, when the word of God was abolished and men and women were killed all over France. Do you remember that the word of God stands forever? Do you remember that through 1260 years of, 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 a, of, of rampant persecution and, and papal apostasy, that the word of God still stood, but it died for a minute. It was wiped out for a minute, but then it was revived. The word of God was resurrected, and then men and women who had kept that word in their heart began to spread it far and wide all around the globe. And then we learned that that word will be triumphant. Not only was it triumphant in the past, it will be triumphant in the future. Nothing, no one is going to take away the word of God. But there is something that does harm it. Just because it will last forever. Just because God has prophesied its triumph. Just because it is sacred even in the holy sanctuary today does not mean that that word by itself will do the work in us. We get to choose that word or not. We get to choose to read it. We get to choose to study it. We get to choose through the Holy Spirit to be illumined by it, to live it, to proclaim it. We have the power to choose it or not to choose it. There is something that can kill it in our lives. And that's our disregard for it, our failure to follow it, and our unwillingness to surrender to it. May God help us. May God help us to be faithful to his word, these witnesses, while we have time before he comes.